In the last video, we, uh, we built our own k-means class. Um, in this one, we're going to be learning about how the one that comes with sklearn works. And usually you'll want to do that because it works, um, it kind of gets all these uh, tricky details right. Um, for example, um, you can easily have it automatically generate varying numbers of starting clusters. Uh, it will often have strategies that are smarter than pure randomness for choosing the positions of those. Uh, before it runs the algorithm. Um, it generally uh, has some uh, logic around when it has been updating the centers enough and it's not going to get any better. And so you can set an upper cap on that, but it's not going to do it more than necessary um, in general. So overall, you're going to want to use k-means uh, that comes with sklearn rather than rolling your own. Um, so the, the k-means actually has these three uh, methods with it that we need to know. We have fit, which is not surprising, right? We've seen fit for both transformers and estimators. Um, what's a little bit strange about it is that it has both transform, uh, like you might expect for a transformer, and predict, like you might expect for an estimator. So, so k-means has some similarities with both um, uh, transformers and estimators, even though um, estimators uh, and prediction is a little bit, uh, it's kind of a strange use of it, right? Because we aren't predicting some label that was given to us, we're both coming up with the labels and predicting them um, at the same time. So it's not really a classic prediction. So I'm gonna just uh, show some rough code or, or kind of data to demonstrate what these three are doing in the context of the code we wrote before, before we actually dive into um, using um, a means. So before in our class, we saw that we had these assign points and update center, and that was the real core of what we needed to do. And um, a fit method, what it'll probably be doing is some sort of loop like this for i and range of something. It's just going to be calling both of those. It'll call the sign points, and it will call the update centers, and it'll do that a bunch of times um, to try to find the, the right answer. And how many times is that? Well, uh, we're going to call that a number of times it does that, the number of epochs, right? And so I'm going to say epochs here. And, and like I was saying, right, in the actual k-means that comes with sklearn, uh, this will be an upper bound, right? If it sees that this is not improving anything further, uh, it might have some uh, break that happens if it's already done, if not getting any better. I'm not going to do that. I'm just trying to write kind of rough code to give you an idea of what's happening. And so when we do this, right, on our version, I plot this at the end, hopefully, Hopefully it's solving this and kind of updating those points. And indeed it is, right? It's kind of figuring out where um, each of those centroids should go. So that's the fit method. Now in, in the process of doing this, we um, created a lot of supplemental information for our original data frame, right? So this was our original data frame that just has some points. And in contrast to that, we have this data frame that the k-means class was using with some extra information. Uh, first, we have the distance to each of the clusters. And, um, and so that can be useful information in and of itself. Uh, but looking at those three distances, we can figure out which number is smallest. In this case, number in the x column is smallest. So this is going to be, uh, this row is going to be in the x cluster. Right, in this next one, uh, the o number is smallest. So we're going to be in the o cluster. And so, when we're looking at, let me actually just shorten this up a bit. When we're looking at uh, using k-means for either transformation or prediction, the only difference is whether we're using these distances or the labels. And so let me do the transformation first to just show you what we'll get there. We'll be effectively getting this data. <coughs> That's what we'll get out when we do a transformation in k-means. And I'll eventually talk about how that's useful as a pre-processing step before we do something like logistic regression. Uh, and then for prediction, all we're really getting is, well, uh, what group does it fit nicely into? And, and again, right, this is not really like classic prediction because we're both deciding what the labels are and deciding which points go with each label. Okay, I'm gonna use k-means on this same data uh, from means from sk learn this time instead of our own and so i'm going to say km equals k means and there's a bunch of configuration options here <coughs> for example how many clusters we want to start with 
Um, I'm going to say uh, we would like to start with three of them. And uh, and then what? We can say km dot fet. We always have to do a fet regardless of whether we're going to do a transformation or prediction next. And I want to fit to that data frame. So let me just look at that one more time. Data frame dot head. So I want to fit that data, and we do. And uh, and once we do that, then we can do either of those things. We could say transform and um, there might be some cases where this is a kind of a training data and then we're trying to um, apply our clusters or force our clusters on some you know second data frame or maybe some test data um, and it'll be very common though that we want to do it to the same original data and so when i'm doing this transformation here i saw well i have three clusters and that's why i'm doing three columns of numbers here right the three distances for uh, e each row in my original data set and um, it is very common, right? Rather than doing fit and then transform, you know, why not do both at once, uh, just like so? Um, that would be a fine thing to do. The same way I can also do a fit predict, and then instead of saying, well, which group is it in, it's trying to tell me specifically, oh, you're in group zero, you're in group two, so on and so forth. And, um, and so something we might wanna do, right, is that I might want to create a copy of my original data frame and then add this prediction in. And I'm going to say, uh, well, what am I going to say? I'm going to call that cluster, right? I could call it you know, classification, something like that. And um, let me actually look at this now. Right, I can see, well, these are the clusters that it's predicted to be in. Maybe I'll look at the tail to see some others, right? And, um, and so I could plot it and I could assign different colors to the different clusters if I wanted to, right? I could say dot plot dot scatter uh, x equals x0, y equals x1, right? We're having x along both dimensions. You get those three things. But I'd really like to see what color they are. So I'm gonna pass in a color equals data frame two of what cluster you are. And, um, and you notice one of these vanishes. So zero ends up being white. And so what I should do is I should pass in a different color map. And so let me head over here and look at the different color maps in matplotlib. Um, cluster zero is not more similar to cluster one than it is to cluster two, right? So I don't really care about getting what is called a sequential um, color map, something like that, where it's kind of on this spectrum. Um, really, zero, one, and two are just different categories for me. So I'm going to be looking into the qualitative color maps, and, um, and I'm just going to go with this one here. It's a nice set of colors, and I'm not going to have more than 10 clusters. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to say I want the tab 10 color map. And now I can see it's actually giving those different colors, those different uh, groups of points. Um, if I wanted to, I could also um, look at the centroids and draw that on top of here. And I get the centroids like so. I can say data, I'm sorry, k means dot cluster centers. And, um, and what am I getting here? Well, the, the coordinates of each centroid are like a row here. And I have three centroids, and that's why I have three rows. And so I could absolutely wrap that up in a data frame. And I could plot it, right? I could um, say dot plot dot scatter, and I could say, well, the x is x zero. Oh, x is zero. Y is one. And I and I could plot those three points. And um, and let me just make them larger and uh, red, right? So I'm gonna say color equals red. Size equals one hundred. Actually, use s here. And I should really combine this with what I had before. I can actually see the centroids. And, um, and to really make it work, I have to say that it should use the same region, right? So, um, you know, let me just split this up here, right? It's getting too long. Centroid, stop, plot, dot, scatter, same AX. <coughs> And so I, and I, I can do all that same stuff just like I did with our, with our own version um, 
version before. Okay, let me address an issue, which is how did I know that we should use three clusters? And well, the answer here is that I just kind of eyeballed it. Uh, what if there's like 20 clusters, right? That might not be so easy to do. Or um, what if instead of having nice two-dimensional data, I have x0, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, it won't be obvious before and how many clusters there are. And so the strategy that you'll do is you'll try a different number of clusters and see how well it does. And this measure of how well it does is, is called inertia. And so I can look at inertia uh, in our data like this. And well, what is this measuring? It's measuring the average squared distance from points to nearest centroid. That's what that means, right? So, so for example, um, this one over here is actually kind of far from that centroid, right? So that'll contribute a lot uh, to this score. Um, whereas this one right here is really close to a centroid, right? So, so hopefully everything's kind of neatly around a centroid. And of course, the more um, the more centroids I have, uh, this number will go down. This inertia number will go down, right? Lower is better. Right? It means well, no, the number means everything's near a centroid. And so what we'll do is we'll actually try different numbers of clusters and see how quickly uh, inertia drops off. So, so let's do this. So I'm going to go back and kind of grab all of the stuff I had before. And, um, and so I'm going to grab this. And, and actually, let, let, me, let me do this. This is what I really need. I am going to have a little loop like this. And I, I don't even care about making the predictions anymore. I just want to know that inertia score. Uh, I'm going to say inertia. Oh, your score. Okay, and so you can see what I'm going to do here. Right? I'm going to try different amounts, and of course, as I add more of these things, the inertia goes down until, well, if I have the same number of clusters and points, then uh, luckily each point hits its own cluster. So I'm going to have a loop here. I'm going to say 4k in range, and I want to have 1 to 10 clusters, right? So k, that's why it's k means. Uh, k is the number of centroids, and mean first the fact that a centroid is kind of the average of all their x, y values. I run this thing, and um, and I want to put all of these in a in a dictionary, or, or better than a dictionary, even a series, right? So I'm going to say uh, scores equals a series, and um, and so I'm going to do it like this. I'm going to say scores of k equals this thing, this this inertia. I'm going to try running this, and when I'm all done. I think there's maybe some issues here still. Um, one of the issues that's actually relatively new in Pandas is that they don't like you to leave it ambiguous what the type is going to be. So I may be very explicit up front. This series is going to have floats. And then the other thing it's complaining about is, well, I have a key error of one. And, and the reason why I have that is because when I just put brackets after a series, uh, it's guessing whether this is an index or an integer position. And now it's guessing incorrectly that it's an integer position, right? So it's guessing this, which of course doesn't work. If I change it to that, uh, voila, I can, I can get my scores. And once I have my scores, of course, I can plot my scores uh, like so. And, um, and, and I should also do this. I should say, I should say that, uh, put some labels here. The well, X label is, K, which is the number of clusters. And my Y label is what? My Y label is the average squared distance to your nearest, um, your nearest uh, centroid, right? And, um, and, and so when I'm looking at this here, I see that having two centroids is much better than having one. So there's two very clear clusters. Um, going from two to three, another big improvement. After that, doesn't make sense to have uh, four, four centroids, right? That's not going to give me much improvement. Um, let, let's try running this again, right? I'm going to run, run it from the top because sometimes these clusters will tend to overlap each other. So just because, you know, way back here, I created three clusters. 
doesn't mean there's going to be three clear clusters at the end. So let me let me just run this again. <coughs> and um, here, right, it's not as clear. Is that two clusters or three clusters? And uh, and not surprisingly, well, there's less benefit going from two to three. Let, let me just try running it a couple more times, get some more intuition here. Okay, so that, that it's very clear that we want to go to three. Uh, I want to see one where it's really overlapping, but it's kind of a matter of luck here. What about that one? Not so much benefit going from two to three, right? Because these two are overlapping each other um, so much, right? Okay, so that's what you'll often want to do. So one of the use cases for these things is that you will create a plot like this just so you can say something about your data. You can say how many kind of distinct clusters um, there are. And that, that of course, is a matter of, of, of prediction. Next time, I'm going to be talking about how we can do, um, where was my notes? What are the uses for these transformations? Why might we want to get data about the distance to each of the clusters?